All right, welcome everybody. My name is Ann Dolan, and today we are talking about some fun interactive ways to teach our kids with ADHD how to manage time and set goals this summer. It is not impossible. There are things that we can do as parents to make a really big difference. Now, I have to tell you, I've talked to a lot of parents at this time of year, and I don't know if you're like these parents, but they're kind of feeling like they're between a rock and a hard place. And it's kind of a normal feeling right now as we approach three long months of summer. You know, on one hand, they're feeling like um, they want their kids to have this relaxed, carefree summer without having to think of anything academic after such a long, arduous year of mostly virtual learning. But on the other hand, they're worried that if their kids sit around and watch TV and play video games, they could have a summer of stagnation and probably even a summer of falling backwards even more academically. But they also don't wanna to have to have that heavy handed homework um, summer school police role where they have to nag and poke and prod and really do whatever it takes to get their kids to do a little bit of academics. And I'm not sure if it feels like that in your home, but there are things you can do to make sure that you don't have to fall into the one or the other bucket. You're not between a rock and a hard place. It's not, um, you know, let them do nothing or having to be a nag the whole summer. There is a happy medium. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So I can tell you, um, after 23 years of owning educational connections, we primarily work with kids with ADHD and executive function issues that there are things parents can do over the summer that can make a profound difference in how their kids show up and they're available for learning in the fall. So this experience, experience has led me to realize that, you know, summers have to be taken with intention. Um, and, and this often, you know, I don't know if this has happened to you, but it, it has happened to me before, it happens to lots of people. You know, you have these grand ambitions in the beginning of the summer, and before you know it, it's August, and you haven't met your own personal goals. Your, you, your kids haven't accomplished what you thought they were going to accomplish, and it just doesn't feel great. So this year, um, because it is a different summer than all the other summers, especially after virtual learning, that we may have to approach the summer with even more intentionality. And that means um, that we have to think what is it that we want our kids to accomplish and how can we make this fun for our kids? So in order to do have a summer of intention, we'll have to raise our own summer GPA. And by GPA, I don't mean your grade point average, actually not at all. But by summer GPA, I'm actually talking about three elements to have a successful summer. And over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about these three elements and some, a few other things here and there for how you and your kids can have a really successful summer and how you can feel like they're going back to school prepared and they're revived, energized, and ready to learn. All right, so let's talk about the GPA. The first element is called go for goals. This is where we're going to actually set goals with our kids, but they're not things we want them to do. There are things they want to do. And we know that with kids with ADHD, if it's their idea, they're far more willing to follow through. If it's somebody else's idea, forget it. They may not do it. Here's the next one, the P. It's for plot the path. Goals are great, but there has to be intention behind them. There has to be a plan of action. And that's where plot the path comes in. And then the last one, is actually academic in nature, whereas the first two are personal pursuits. They actually don't have anything to do with academics. They have more to do with finding what you love to do and planning it out, firing up those executive function skills, working on time management, whereas the third one is more about um, academics, reading, writing, or math. All right, so let's get started and talk about the first one the g this is called go for goals so here's how this one works you've got to gather everybody in your whole family together and i would plan on about 45 minutes um this is a good time of year to do it i wouldn't probably do this in july it feels a little bit late you want to do it at the beginning of the summer so either right when school is getting out around now or you know right when school does get out and you're going to say to your family all right Let's use this time and talk about the summer and, and talk about some goal setting. 
Now, here's how it's gonna work when everybody's together. You're actually gonna need a few items. You're gonna need some good old fashioned post-it notes. Um, you're gonna need a pen for everybody. Ideally, if you have a whiteboard around your house, fabulous. A big one is great. If not, no worries. If you have a piece of poster board um, or you have a blank wall in your house that you can put sticky notes on, that's fabulous. And then lastly, you need your phone because you're gonna need the timer in your phone. All right, so once everybody's together, you're gonna give each person a small stack of sticky notes and a pen. And then you're gonna set your whiteboard up and you're gonna write each person's name on the whiteboard. You're then going to set the timer for four minutes. And you're going to say, how do you want to learn and grow this summer? What are the things that you want to do? And you might have to model this at first for your kids. Um, for example, you might say, well, I've had these two books sitting by my nightstand and my goal is to read one of them this summer. Or you might talk about um, a skill that you want to learn. It can be anything, but you might have to kind of put the bug in their ear just so they have a sense of what you're talking about. And then you set the timer for four minutes and everybody's writing down the things that they want to accomplish. And there are no bad answers, but they can't be digital in nature. It can't be like, I'm on level one of this Xbox game and I want to be at level five. That doesn't count. Um, here's an example of what this is going to look like. You can see the whiteboard with everybody's name. And this is actually my friend, Michaela. I did this with her and her family and my other friend. And I've done this with lots of families over the years and lots of kids. It's actually tons of fun. And even really reluctant kids, you might think, oh, my kid, he'll never do this. Kids actually love this because it's all about them. And she got up at first. And usually parents say something like, um, I want to read those books on my nightstand. But she said, I want to um, enjoy my kids more. I want to yell less. And that was the first thing she put up on her sticky note. And it actually um, it started a big discussion. It was really awesome. Um, but then she went and she talked about each thing that she wanted to accomplish over the summer. So this is what the board looked like after um, a few people went. So this is my other friend. She went up and she did hers. These are the two teenagers on the right. And here are the goals. It has to be positive because the point of this exercise is really to have fun and to build trust. It's not, there are no right and wrong answers. There are no grades for this. There's no participation mark. It doesn't matter if kids come up with wild things that they wanna do. Our job as parents is just to say things like, oh, what a creative idea. I love the way you thought about that. Huh, I haven't thought about doing that. So you wanna be able to cheer each other on and always be a coach and not a critic. So once everybody gets their turn to go up, and you'll learn so many cool things about your kids that you never learned before, um, that it, it's so powerful. You're gonna then pause after everybody goes, and now you're gonna ask another question. What are your top two goals? So like, if you could only pick two things that you really wanted to do and that you really think you can accomplish, what would those be? And, and then each person goes back around and they move those top things to the, to the very top of their board. Um, so for example, I went and um, I enjoy running, but I wanted to challenge myself and do these like very short sprint triathlons. So that was one of my goal to, um, to complete two of those. Catherine, she's in high school, she's in ninth grade. She said she wanted to get her driver's license. Um, William said he wanted to plan a major league baseball trip that his family had been on before and they had never thought about doing it, but he said he was going to map out the distance and the budget and the game schedule and he was really, really into it. Um, Amy said she wanted to create a new website for her business. So the point is that everybody kind of laser focuses on what they really want to do. And I will tell you, this is great for kids of all ages. It's not just for high school kids. Even kids as young as four can do it. You can see this little girl here. She got in there on the app. Um, the boys in this picture, one of them said that he wanted to catch a snook, which is apparently this very elusive fish. And he was going to research um, the type of bait he needed, the time of day, where is the best location, um, all these things for catching this, this special fish. And so anytime kids think of their own things, they're definitely more willing to do them, but they're also willing to do the work behind them and research if they have to. 
All right, so we've got some goals set, but goals are only as good as getting them done. And that's where a plot the path comes in. Now I will tell you that for some kids, just coming up with goals may be where you want to stop. But many kids can come up with a few ways they're gonna accomplish this. And this is really where you can, man you can teach kids to manage their time and to think ahead. This is an executive function skill called planning. And for kids with ADHD, I will tell you the skill of planning and organizing time is the most difficult one, but it impacts them the most. They're often in the now, like, oh, I'll just do what I have to do right now. I don't know what's due tomorrow. I don't know what's due next week. Um, this helps them to think ahead a little bit. So here's how it works. Um, I've actually made these little worksheets for everybody. And I'll tell you where to get them in a second. But this is an example of one that Catherine did. Again, she wanted to get her license. So she wanted to get it mid-August. So she put it down in mid-August. And then she backward plans the steps that she needed to do to get her license in August. Now, if this might be hard for your child, you might say, oh, when do you wanna get this done by? It might be three weeks from now. It could be a month. It doesn't have to be the full two months of the summer. Um, so it can be a shortened period of time. You may also have to ask questions. Oh, that's your goal. What's the first step in getting that done? What might you think, what might you do first? What might you do second? How about third? So you may have to get your child going on this. So the reason I love this is it fires up those executive function skills and again, helps kids to think ahead and they get practice planning on things that they like. So in the fall, when they have to plan ahead for a book report due in two weeks or a big test, an exam, it makes it easier for them because now they've been able to take something big and break it down into smaller increments so they've had that practice. It doesn't feel so foreign to them. And remember, <laughs> this is not a graded assignment. So our goal is not to micromanage kids and to make them write down every detail. This honestly is big picture. If they write down some decent goals, um, even a couple, honestly, that's fine. We don't wanna criticize because anytime kids feel judged, especially kids with ADHD, they will stop, they will push away and they will not engage with us. And, and right now we just wanna have fun and, and build trust with our kids. All right, so we got that. Let me show you where you can get this if you think it would be helpful to you and your family. If you text 55, 444, you can get the instructions to this activity and the plot the path worksheets. So it's super easy. Um, text 55444 and then the word summer GPA, all one word, and it will come straight to your inbox. If you live internationally, email me and I'll send it to you because the texting number doesn't work outside the US. And my email is ann, A N N, at ectutoring.com. And like Trish said, um, once we get this all organized, we'll have it um, up on the website for you too. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the things that we're gonna do, but now we might need some accountability behind it. We know for our kids that, you know, if they have an idea and a plan, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna get done. So for that reason, you may have a family meeting once a week. I'm a huge fan of family meetings for kids. And if they're non-judgmental and all you're doing is thinking ahead, they can be extremely powerful in helping kids to manage their time. I personally like Sundays because Sundays, first of all, there's not a ton of stuff going on on Sunday evenings. Um, usually you have a family dinner on Sunday evenings and usually there aren't any organized sports or other things. And also I like Sundays because it's a launching pad for the week ahead. It allows kids to think and get organized, even if it's in their heads, for what's gonna come up this the coming week instead of just showing up to school on Monday. You know, oh, what do I have? I can't remember, I'm not sure. So in the summer though, you're gonna use the Sunday session to ask how your kids are doing. Um, how are they doing with their goals? So you might say, how did your week go? Or how are you coming along with the things you wanna do? And in this meeting, which can easily be over dinner, 
every person reports, even you and your partner, your spouse, whomever, everybody reports just a minute or so on how they're doing. And if you find that um, you have a child who hasn't followed through on something, instead of saying, why didn't you do this? You said you were gonna do this and you didn't do it. What's up? You want to change that into a powerful question to really find out what's happening. So you, won't, you don't wanna ask an accusatory question. Instead, you wanna ask a collaborative one like, oh, what got in your way? Your child might say, I was watching too many TikTok videos last night. If they say that, then you say, oh, tell me about that. Not, oh, well, you shouldn't do that, obviously. That puts kids on the defensive. But even if you just say, tell me about it, they'll often tell you about it. And sometimes they'll say, yeah, maybe tomorrow night I, I won't watch as many videos. Kids are smart. They can often solve their own problems. You can also ask, looking ahead, how might you approach this week? You could say, what's the first step you might take this week? Or which day do you want to start this? So it's taking something big and again, making it feel smaller. These are all powerful questions. So here's the thing with the Sunday session. As I mentioned, you may wanna keep it going all school year long. And during the school year, you wanna ask these questions. What do you have coming up? Do you have any big projects or tests? What's something small you can do to get started? Again, allowing kids to look ahead. You know, when we work with kids as executive function coaches, this is one of the most important things we do. We set our kids up for success for the week ahead. And we'll ask these questions and we'll share screens and we'll look at what's coming up with the student and say, tell me about that. Tell me what you have going on in math. How are you feeling about that? Um, oh, I see it's due on Thursday. Um, let's talk about where you're gonna record that. Now, some of the platforms will automatically populate that due date in the calendar, and that's fabulous. But what they won't do is if the student has something due on Friday, it won't obviously break it down into smaller pieces. And so what I found during the school year is for kids with ADHD, if we as educators create a to-do list for them, like, oh, it's due on Friday, make sure you do um, this, that, and the other thing, it will not get done. It's far more likely to get done if we help the student calendar it. And that means, let's say it's a, a test on Friday that requires the completion of a study guide. Oh, on Tuesday, you're gonna finish the study guide. On Wednesday, you're going to um, make a copy of it and fill in um, the first half of a new study guide, basically repeating it again, because we all know that practice tests and practicing study guides are actually the best way to improve a test score. So we'll take that thing and we'll help the student break it down and then it gets in the child's calendar. So these things are helpful. If that feels like too much as a parent or your child will not work with you in that capacity, it's okay. The easier thing to do is just to say, what do you have coming up? Do you have any big projects or tests? And even if your child isn't highly verbal and says like, oh, gee, mom, yeah, I've got, let's see, I've got a chemistry test on Thursday. I can't forget about my English exam. And oh, I really need to work on that science lab. It's not gonna happen but it will help your child start thinking about it. Even if they don't verbalize it, it will put that bug in the head that they, their head that they do have these things coming up. All right, so we talked about two tools of intention, um, the go for goals when plotting the path, and we've talked about using powerful questions and using that Sunday session as kind of like a family meeting. But let's talk about academics, because in all honesty, some kids can get by over the summer without doing much with academics. But for many of our kids with ADHD, they straddle the fence that, you know what, if they don't do anything at all, they're really gonna be caught behind in the fall. And so if that's your kid, let me share with you a couple of ideas that can help. Um, this is called Academics in Action, and it's the A of the GPA. And 
with this, just like you're going to be intentional about not telling your kids what to do over the summer, but letting them choose things, you don't want to go into the summer thinking, oh, my kid, well, he's kind of behind in reading, writing, and math. I better, you know, make sure he does all these things. It will not work with a child with ADHD. You have to be strategic and you have to think, what is the low hanging fruit? Like, what is the subject that, you know, he needs the most help with or she could really benefit from that could make her feel a lot better in the fall. So I'm going to share with you lots of ideas for both reading and writing and math. Don't feel like you have to write everything down. Again, um, as part of the activity I just shared with you, I've got a ton of resources for the summer. And what I love about this document is it's, it's based on um, grade level. So it shows you elementary, middle, and high school. And you can get that again by texting 55444 and then summer GPA, doesn't matter about the capitals, but all one word. All right, so let's get started and talk about math. Here are a couple of resources that are online for math. One is IXL and it's um, an adaptive math. They have everything, but I think it's best for math, a platform for learning math. This would be for older students, older elementary, middle of high school. For younger kids, I love Arcadenics. Um, it's like an arcade. In academics all in once and all in one and it's video game based and kids really love it that's for elementary schoolers especially younger kids all right so here's something old school you know if you're like sick of your kid being online all the time you may not want to do those but you may want to pull out an old workbook and this is what i will say for kids with adhd the 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 ones that are super focused tend to be best for them like just working on maybe multiplication and division facts or just practicing fractions and decimals because it's focused and um if you can get them to do something that feels easy and they can do it independently that's better whereas something like the summer bridge activities they sound great in theory oh um i want you to bridge from fifth grade to sixth grade these are all the skills you need to learn it's super frustrating for kids because they haven't seen everything. It's based on curriculum across the country and it can be really frustrating for kids. So this summer, we have to lower our kids' frustration tolerance so they, they will do it. Um, I have two sons with ADHD and when they're in college now, but when they were younger, in the summer, um, I would have these super targeted workbooks, usually around math, fluency, like math facts, and I would dog ear like two pages or I would dog ear three pages and I would have them do every other question or I would make it feel easy to them that they could finish it in 15 minutes. And that's all they did. First thing in the morning before they went anywhere, they did this for 15 minutes and they did it Monday through Friday. So they were used to the routine. So I can recommend something like that old school for kids for ADHD with ADHD but it has to be, um, it has to meet a couple of criteria. So I'll share that with you in a second. All right, so if you're not sure what your child needs to practice, what I would do at this time of year is to ask the teacher. And you might even try the one thing approach, like, okay, Mrs. Smith, in math, what's the one thing, if Jimmy could only work on one thing, what would that be? And find that out and then, find out what would be good resources. Um, I tell you, this summer is so different. You know, I've been running my business for 23 years and usually we kind of know in the summer, like the skills that kids are gonna um, need from say like pre-algebra to algebra, for example. Um, we know that these are like the main skills we need to make sure they're solid in seventh grade. And then we'll preview some really important skills are coming up in eighth grade. This summer, it's like total Swiss cheese. I've seen kids that just have these huge holes in their learning um, because they've been in virtual learning so long. And so what we're doing this year is we're assessing every student that comes to us with, it's like a super quick and easy 20 minute assessment. And we're seeing, like, what do you know? <laughs> what don't you know? Um, because it feels different for every child this year. So that's why I would say, you know, either outsource the assessment and hire a professional um, to do it or ask the teacher what your child may need to, to work on. 
Okay, so let me get back to what's important this summer. So as I mentioned, it needs to be short and easy. Like honestly, 15 minutes a day. Doesn't need to be an hour, doesn't need to be two hours, none of that stuff. Easy. It has to be independent. If your child is slaving over it, if they're crying over it, they don't understand it, it is too hard. It should be independent. It should be so that it feels like they can accomplish it and it's fairly easy for them. It's okay if it's easy for them. It's really fine because the goal is for them to repeat and practice and feel confident. It should be on consecutive days. Don't do like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday thing because that downtime, Tuesday, Thursday, kids will get off the routine. Even if you do it four days a week or three days, make sure the days are successive. And then lastly, set up the plan early in the summer. Um, sit down with your child and talk about it. Say, like I spoke to Mrs. Smith, she said you need to work on your math facts. Um, let's talk about how that's gonna get done. You could say, we could do it at 8.30 or nine. <laughs> what would you choose? Uh, we can work in this workbook or an online platform. What would be best for you? So there may be a little bit of give and take, but I would suggest talking about it early. Don't think like, oh, I'm going to give my child a break for a month and then we'll, we'll get around to this. You won't get around to it because kids will be stuck in their own ways. And it's hard at that point to introduce something new. So just discuss it. Even if you don't start it for two weeks, discuss it. Have it in writing, have a start date, put it on the refrigerator so it's clear to everybody. All right, so let's talk about some other things, um, other areas for writing and reading. Writing, if you've got a reluctant writer, this is one of my favorite go-to things. We use it for kids all the time that are reluctant. Um, there's this guy named John Spencer. He has a YouTube page for kids that don't like to write. <laughs> and he also has a just started this brand new website called videowritingprompts.com. And he's fabulous. Kids watch a video and they have um, a little writing, some writing practice. This is one thing I've done with kids over the years. I actually learned this from a high school teacher, an English teacher of mine, and I loved it. She would write to us in our own little composition books once a week. We'd write back to her on Mondays. Um, and I felt like I knew her a lot more as a person and she knew me because I would share my feelings with her, what I did over the weekends. And I've done this with kids um, every year. I did this with students in my class when I taught um, I taught special ed and I was also a general ed teacher. Every Monday, we did dialogue journals and I just loved it. As a parent, I always did these over the summers with my kids and I would ask them questions like, oh, um, you know, it could be anything like, um, Oh, tell me how you're feeling about your basketball coach or what was your favorite, the favorite play you practiced today? And the goal is let our kids write. Maybe we associate it with relaxation. Maybe they do it at night before they go to bed, but we can't critique. So no correction of spelling, no grammar, <laughs> it's let it go. All this is an activity just to get to know our kids and write back and forth. It only needs to be a couple of times a week. It doesn't honestly need to be that much. But the idea is just get kids writing. Now for reading, here's something easy. Research shows, um, in fact, the, some of the groundbreaking research out of Oxford University that was done a number of years ago, uh, showed that kids improve their comprehension and their vocabulary more if they watch TV with subtitles than without. So subtitles actually force kids to read. Um, and it's so easy. If you're watching Netflix or something on YouTube, select subtitles and say you can watch an hour without subtitles. You can watch two hours with subtitles. It's easy. So that's something simple we can um, get kids to do to make sure they're reading. If you want them to read more traditional books, I would recommend getting the summer reading list from school, looking at that with your child or going on Amazon. I mean, Amazon, the search isn't just for like um, call of the wild and finding that book. You can also query by things like books for reluctant elementary school boys, um, books for middle school girls who like horses. And the Amazon query will find you those books. So it's really awesome. And audio books are also super easy for kids. There's nothing wrong with kids listening to a book. It's not cheating. Um, it's definitely better than not reading at all. 
All right, so I want to um, wrap up because we just have a couple of minutes left and talk about something super important, which is when kids are going to be freshest to do any of this work and to think about managing their time and um, thinking about some things that can be hard for them. We know that any individual, kid, adult, whoever, they are best at the beginning of the day. This is when we think of the three stages of timing of the day. This is our very best. In fact, the morning is when every school in America gives kids standardized testing because this is when they score best. So anytime up until around lunchtime, people are in the best mood, they're most focused, they have the most amount of energy and they're able to do the hardest work. They're also the most vigilant, which means they're able to bat away like distractions, their phone or their brother playing on the other room and focus on what they have to do. But every human being it really um, has this actually big drop off in the afternoon. And it's the worst at around three o'clock. And this is called a trough. And a trough is like when you just don't feel like doing anything. Um, you know, for us as adults, we go and grab a cup of coffee for kids. They tend to want to gravitate to something digital. That's why when kids get home from school or camp, um, often they don't want to play. They just want to sit down with their video game or their phone or their tablet because this feels passive and good to them. But the good news is there's a recovery kind of around five o'clock in the end of the day. I bring this up because as a parent, you know, whenever we want our kids, we think about like, when should we get our kids to do some things that are hard? It should be in the morning or during this recovery time at the end of the day. So if we want our kids to work on 15 minutes of math in the morning, that's a great time. Or maybe at around dinner time is okay too. But what we don't wanna do is to waste this time that kids are their very best and letting them have their tablet first thing in the morning. That's not a great use of time, especially if you want them to do something academic. That's a great use of time in a trough. Like this is when you wanna pick those easy passive tasks. So when we think about managing time and we think about planning our time ahead and breaking something big down, we also wanna think about when is the best time and when are we gonna bump work out a lot faster with a lot less you know, mental energy um, when is that? So for that reason, you know, anytime um, kids are in a trough, it's not a great time for them to do this. We call it heavy lifting. All right. So um, as I wrap up, I want to mention that you may feel like you don't still want that role. Like maybe these are good ideas. Um, maybe you can do things like um, the first two that I talked about. Uh, coming up with goals, the post-it note activity and plotting the path, but anything academic, you just don't want to go there with your child. And it's okay. Somebody else can do this work with your child. It could be the college student home from vacation over, over the summer. It could be a professional executive function coach. That's what we do. We work with kids throughout the summer and into the fall to shore up these skills. It does. It just doesn't have to be you. And sometimes parents will say, my child just doesn't want to learn this. And actually what I found over the years is that kids do want to learn. They just don't always want to learn from their parent. I found this to be true as a parent myself, even though I do this for a living. It's a universal thing. All right, so as we wrap up, um, I want to remind you that you can contact me anytime. Um, I'm always available to you. My email is ann at ectutoring.com. If you want the resources I talked about, here it is, 55444, Summer GPA. And then also, we have a ton more articles in our blog online, and that's ectutoring.com. And as Trish mentioned, this recording will go out to you with this information as well. So, um, and if you're stuck, let me know. I'm happy to talk to you on the phone. Um, as we wrap up, I want to let you know that you do not have to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. There is a happy medium. And if you go for goals, plot the path, have a little bit of accountability along the way and come up with a few activities for action, even if it's just one subject, 
your child will have a summer of success. Uh, what happens when kids are at camp or on vacation? All right, so if kids are at camp, um, and kids are at camp a lot of the summer, you know, so what I would do is depending on when they go to camp, if there's time in the morning, even if they do five or 10 minutes of something, that's fabulous. It's often hard, as I mentioned, when they get home from camp to get them to do anything. They might be super tired later in the day. So I would just kind of play around with it. I would start in the morning. If that doesn't work, then try with it later. Or you could ask kids like for 10 minutes, what time do you want to do this? Um, you can have that discussion with your kids. On vacation, you'll have to decide. Um, you know, it, it honestly depends how many vacations are you on. If it's once a week, I'd let it go. If you're on four weeks of vacation, I would still bring a workbook. I always did this with my kids. And even if they just did it a couple of times, that's fine. So I'd look at your schedule and see, you know, is this a tremendous amount of time that we're gonna be away? If it is, um, I'd probably bring a few things for them to do along the way. Uh, what resources do you recommend to improve comprehension skills? Well, for comprehension, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, for example, I mentioned IXL for math, but IXL actually also has a platform for reading. And I think it's $14.99, but it's, it's worth it. And you can get a combined, you can get a couple of subjects together for a lower price. But I think anything that's adaptive is really helpful. And that means that when your child starts missing questions, the software realizes that they don't quite understand that skill and it will work. The software knows, oh, you know, Susie doesn't understand that skill. Let's practice more of the skill with Susie. And so I would find a software like that that's adaptive. So I think IXL is probably one of the best ones out there. Also in terms of comprehension, you know, I think it's okay to read with kids at night. And um, for example, you might, if you have a reluctant reader, you might do a lot of the reading. You read two pages, your child reads a page, um, or you read a page, they read a page. And you do not wanna pepper them with questions all the time. Like, oh, tell me about that word. What do you think that means? Why do you think he did that? That gets annoying to kids but you can ask them before you, they start, um, oh, what happened in the last chapter? Those are important questions because often kids will start reading and they won't recall what they read about last time. So it's super important that they have that anchor. And in fact, previewing, um, and previewing comes in different forms. It can be recalling what they just read. It can be looking ahead at the pictures to see what's in the chapter. Um, it can be reading the inside cover or the back cover of the book before they start reading. So previewing basically means having a sense of what you're about to read. That is the number one comprehension strategy. So anytime we can get our kids to preview before they start, that's super powerful. Um, the next question comes from a parent who says that um, she's not necessarily a morning person. And you were mentioning earlier that uh, kids do better in the morning. Uh, what should a parent do in that case? I would look at that recovery period at around dinner time. I'd play around with it. You know, if you have a kid in about, it, I forget what the number is. It's, it's, I think it's like between 10, about 10% 10 of people are actual night owls. Like they really, really are. The, the, the majority of people though are not, you know, they don't have the propensity to stay up super late and sleep really late. But if you happen to have a night owl and it is biological, living in, under your roof, you're not gonna get, they're not gonna do their best work in the morning. And so for those kids, they're gonna be better probably around dinner time. So I play with it around that time and ask. Um, I personally think before dinner is better because you just kind of get it bumped out. But I would ask, do you wanna do this before dinner or after dinner? You know, what type, what kind, what time is good for you? And get their buy-in a little bit as well. My, Girl likes to play first a little bit, have breakfast, and more like 11 or noon, she starts to do some work, which is hard as I'm working. I remind her and give her a choice to finish 
before I come home by six. Is that okay or is it too flexible? It is pretty flexible. I might play around with it to see if maybe she might do a little bit more work in the morning. Um, it, I might put a time on it, like before 10 o'clock, for example, and see if that works. But if it's before six, before you get home, then, and I'm not sure how old the child is, but now we're giving the student the expectation that they manage their time for like eight hours, which is really, really difficult. But if they get up at eight and now you're giving the expectation it's done by 10, you're only asking them to manage their time for two hours. And that feels a little bit more doable to kids. What I also might recommend is that you get a timer. And um, my favorite timer, you may have heard of it, it's called a time timer. And it's like this little square timer and it has this red floating disc. Um, so if you set it for like 20 minutes, the little red disc will, um, will move around and so the, the red disc diminishes as the time goes by. So for kids that have a poor sense of, of time, um, what we do in my practice is we teach kids to use a timer and we'll say, all right, um, set the timer for a really short period of time, never more than a half hour and even like 15 minutes is fine. Set the timer for 15 minutes and you say to yourself, I'm gonna work as hard as I can, best I can, focus as much as I can for just 15 minutes. When the timer goes off, I can take a break. And what I might do with your daughter when you go to work is teach her some of these strategies like the timer and see if that helps her to manage her time a little bit more. Um, it just kind of puts constraints around it for her. So if getting started is hard for her, the timer will help. Uh, my kid loves to read, but he hates writing. What resources do you recommend for having them practice writing? I love the idea, as I mentioned, the, the dialogue journals. Um, you can ask him in the dialogue journal, um, you know, who is your favorite author? Draw a picture of the cover of the book, or can you draw a picture of your favorite character? I'd love to see um, how you picture him. And just getting kids to put something down on paper is, is just really awesome. And then you have, as I mentioned, that little keepsake at the end of the year. I don't think there's anything wrong with paper and pencil journaling. And it may feel old fashioned, but because kids have not picked up a paper and pencil much of this past year, because so much has been online, I see nothing wrong with it. And there have been a lot of studies that show how important it is for kids to have that visual motor integration practice. So visual motor integrating the two and practicing. It really helps with their development. So I would really consider the dialogue journal. Um, and I also mentioned the video prompt website. That might be helpful for a child that doesn't like to write. If your child hasn't quite learned how to keyboard, that could be something that's really positive. And um, there's tons of software and online programs for keyboarding, depending on his age, that he can practice over the summer. And what I found for like super reluctant writers, once kids um, can keyboard better, often that gives them, it opens up a new world for them. And then lastly, for older kids, there's a software called Rev, R-E-V. And Rev is, I use it a lot myself um, because that's hard for me too. And Rev allows you to dictate what you want to write. And um, for a dollar a minute, a scribe will type it will type it out. And there's tons of already voice to text software. Like that's nothing new. Google Voice has that. But this is different in that a human being is on the other side. Um, they, they get your recording, they transcribe it, and it has the correct punctuation, the correct spelling, um, the correct paragraphing and indentation. So often when kids get that back and, you know, for an essay, it might be like five bucks. Um, they can then modify it and change it. So for middle and high school kids, that that program, Rev, has been really helpful to them, especially for um, reluctant writers. Um, I do have a question from Veronica and I want to kind of just say to Veronica, um, I think it's a great topic. Um, that uh, the, her question is is about um, information for college students or young adults. And I think that's a, a topic 
a, a webinar topic um, <laughs> on its own. And I think that's something that we should do. But do you have any like quick tips for um, those young adults that might be um, interested in setting goals and, and preparing maybe for the upcoming school year? Mm -hmm. I would absolutely do the go for goals activity with them. Um, I still do it with my kids and they're in college. And I, I did it recently with both of them and, and my older son's girlfriend. And it's just, it's so awesome to hear like now that they're adults, like what their ambitions are. Um, one of my kids said he wanted to learn how to weld and, and make a lamp. And I thought, oh, I'll never do that. I, I didn't say that out loud, but that's what I thought. Like, oh, it's one of those pie in the sky things, but he did it. Um, and he, and he really, he like really put his mind to it and he had a little plan of action. So he, I never thought that was of interest to him in the past. So I would do that activity with him. The other thing I would mention is um, the learning schools that, you know, the learning centers at universities are, are like so awesome. They're so different than they were even five or 10 years ago. And you can get a coach at a learning center at your school who helps you just with planning. And if that's the issue, executive function and dealing with procrastination and planning ahead, I would have a weekly appointment set up or even bi-weekly, every twice a week. Um, and it doesn't have to be in person. In fact, I think that this is even better online because you can meet, like we do this online now because we meet with kids more frequently and that frequency helps with accountability. So I would go to the learning center, get set up with um, a coach who can help with planning. Um, and the first thing at the beginning of the year is to take the syllabus for each class and make sure those due dates are either populated on the calendar or you put them on the calendar and then put start dates. So a coach at the learning center can help you do all those things. And I would recommend getting that set up even before school starts. I am a homeschool parent. My son dislikes learning with me. Do you have any suggest suggestions on how we can build our teacher learner relationship? Yes. Um, first of all, I would um, I would turn it around to to making everything positive as much as possible and follow the 80-20 rule. Like 80% is positive, 20% is not critical, but it, it maybe it's redirection. But if you can go towards the 80% positive, it could change the feeling of the relationship, especially to your child. The other thing is um, there's a lot of, and, and I, it's been a while since I've looked at them, but there are a lot of programs that provide a teacher in certain subjects and a live teacher. So that might be something that would be helpful to your child or also a co-op group where somebody else teaches the lesson. But for the lessons that you teach, I would, um, I would try, I would sit down and say to your child, I would like to make this more collaborative. I want this to be as fun as possible for you. Um, let's talk about ways we can do that and be a good listener and see what he, he says and um, see if you can brainstorm a couple of ideas together to make it a little bit more pleasurable. But when kids have input, I found that they often change their tune and their attitude a lot faster. Uh, do you have a sample summer schedule for elementary age children who aren't going to camp? Hmm. I don't have a sample one that I've written out, um, but I would um, I would follow the three stages that I talked about, three, three stages of timing and anything that you want them to do. It's academic, I would put in the morning um, and they can have their digital stuff later on after they get done with those things or TV. So I don't have anything written out, but I would just try to follow that general pattern and make sure they're outside as much as possible too, which I know everybody knows. Um, my child struggles with writing and is finishing high school and they're looking at a gap year. So do you have any um, ideas on how they can basically fill their time during that gap year. That will be helpful. Sure, I know there's a lot of gap year programs. There's also gap year leadership programs, which may be helpful too. Um, but certainly I'm not an expert in that field. I, I know a lot of kids that have taken gap years that we've worked with over the years. And 
Um, I haven't found anybody that regretted it. It's always been a very positive experience, especially when work is involved. Um, so, you know, oftentimes we, we say things like, oh, this generation, they just don't want to work harder. They can't take feedback or, you know, they're so entitled. But I honestly feel that a lot of the kids, first of all, this is the smartest generation. Um, they're so technically savvy. But secondly, you know, for many of us, when we turned 16, we got our license and we got a summer job. And for many of our kids, they haven't had that experience. And so they just haven't learned um, to be an employee and to deal in, with difficult situations. So in this gap year, certainly having a job can be super helpful, especially in this market when everybody wants to hire. Um, there's so many jobs to be had. I'm sorry, I'm not a gap year expert, but I can just share with you that um, working in the gap year has been helpful for many of the students that we've worked with. All right, it looks like we have covered all of our questions. Um, is there anything that you would like to add before we wrap up for this evening? I would just uh, encourage everybody to um, really, you know, go out with a bang, have a really awesome summer, um, and make sure that kids are learning along the way. It doesn't have to be hardcore. It just needs to be a little bit most days of the week. And um, I believe that they will go back to school feeling a lot more confident and available for learning. So I wish everybody the very best summer. And if I can be of help, um, just shoot me an email at ann at ectutoring.com. Thanks so much, Trish, for having me. Oh, thank you um, for providing us with this great information and all of the tips. It was really helpful. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. We appreciate you being here. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anne. You're welcome. Have a great day. Good night.